speaking about the last and final message of Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, who had mentioned in a authentic tradition, can you comment on this? Because it goes with what we're talking about, the heart. He said there's a, more so in the body, uh, that if it's sound, the whole body will be sound. If it's corrupt, the whole body will be corrupt. Can you comment on this? Uh, and then he said that that morsel is the heart. The heart. The heart. Now, uh, there is, uh, I just wanted to, the, I, on the heart, speaking of the heart and having a sound heart, uh, the Prophet also mentioned a narration uh, in which he mentions there's a man who uh, lost his child, uh, a young child, an infant. And Allah, he actually describes the conversation that takes place between Allah and the angels. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala obviously knows exactly what happened. But this conversation is described by the Prophet so that we can learn something from it and uh, take away a very important lesson. He describes that this, Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the angels that you took the soul of the infant of my slave. The angels say, yes, we did. That was what was commanded to us. He asked, did you take away the f apple of his eye? Qabattum thamarata fu'adihi. The fruit of his heart is literal translation. The better translation would be the apple of his eye, the joy of his life. And they say, the angels say, yes. فَمَاذَا قَالَ abdi? What did my slave say when this tragedy happened? The angel said, حَمِدَكَ وَاسْتَرْجَعَ He praised you and he said, إِنَّا لِلَّهِ Wa inna ilayhi rajiun. We to Allah we are, we belong to Allah and we will return to Allah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, build a house in Jannah for this slave and call it the house of praise. The point is that this man, anonymous, not named in this narration, this could be anybody, this could be anybody in the crowd, anybody who's listening, anybody who suffered this incredible loss. This could be any of those people. This is a person who's demonstrating what it means to have a sound heart that they have this connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even in the most difficult time in their life when they've just lost their child they're still able to remember Allah and not just remember Allah, thank Allah and remind themselves that we are in fact uh, we belong to Allah and we will eventually return to Him those, uh, the, the, uh, those actions at the strike of the most difficult calamity that shows uh, the true soundness of the heart we're talking about having a sound, the sound heart at the Sound Heart Convention in Toronto, Canada. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. This is the 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 thing, this is the And we're talking about the heart. I mean, right now we're living in a generation where it's I this, I that, iPhone, iMac, all of these eyes, and we're charging these things. So how, how can someone charge the heart? If you now, like, they know, okay, I can plug this in and my iPhone get charged, but how do you charge the heart? Uh, I think one of the most significant aspects of connecting one's heart to Allah is uh, through the ritual aspects that are requested of us. And, you know, God asks us really simple things. You know, God has a right upon us. He's the one who has given us everything that we have. Uh, and he asks for us, you know, to pray five times a day. And those prayers, those cyclical, consistent, every day of every week of every month till death surprises us, is a constant connection. The word for Prayer is called salah, which means sila. It's a connection to God. And, and, and that's a, you know, it's, it's a profound statement that we connect ourselves to Him constantly in prayer. Our prayer, it's not just simply saying, I need this and I want you to protect me from that. But it's more about praise. You know, you began by saying, Allahu Akbar. Everyone said, Allahu Akbar. Everything that is done well and significantly deserves an ovation. You know, uh, if a concert or a pianist does something great, people listen to it, they were enthralled. At the end of it, they all stand up and they, you know, it's like, wow, and they applaud and it was in appreciation. And for us, that standing before God and the declaration of Allahu Akbar, nothing is greater 
for me than God. Nothing is of more benefit to me than God. No one can help me more than God. No problem is too great than Allah. All of that solidifies the heart. Like it makes your heart firm. And it gives you a surety and, and, and resilience in, in the tempest of the world and the difficulties that we experience. So I think that's the beginning point where we seek to reclaim our heart. That we lay it bare to the one who sees in it, subhanahu wa ta'ala. What kind of advice would you give for someone, he just mentioned, to reclaim your heart. So someone has given their heart to materialism. They just want the latest car and they feel that's going to make them happy, you know, sticking and just waiting for the next fashion design to come out. And they're just engrossed, intoxicated with all of the things that are out there of entertainment. And now the heart is connected to all of these celebrities and all of the other wild stuff that's out there. And now you just mentioned reclaim. You need to reclaim your heart. What advice would you give for someone who tuned in right now and they're like, you know what? I, I, I want to reclaim my heart. Um, I think uh, there's, there's a number of ways, but one thing that I, I usually suggest and recommend people to do if you really want to soften your heart and reclaim it, look at people that have less than you. You know, today, like you mentioned, we live in a day and age where we've got iPhones and iPads and, you know, gadgets and tablets and technology and it's everywhere. Like even my watch beeps and vibrates when it's time for me to, you know, wake up in the morning, the alarm. It's just crazy. I get my messages, you make phone calls. Like our life is just revolved around the world. And not everyone has that. And, you know, an example that I like to use in terms of, uh, you know, just to make people understand what I'm trying to say is remember those who have less than you. I remember when I went to the Philippines at one point in time and I asked the brothers and the sisters, you know what I said, during my trip, I really want to go to the slums. And they're like, the slum? Like, it's dangerous. Why would you want to go there? So they took me to the slums and while I was there, you know, I saw children who for us, like today, we see children playing with iPads and the parents don't even know how to use it. These children would go down to the stream where the sewage water would flow into and they would get little pieces of like wood or straw or some piece of cardboard from like someone's juice box and they'd rip it, rip it off and go back up to the stream of sewage water flowing down the hill and they would race it and see whose piece of garbage reached the garbage at the bottom before the other kids. And so that was their joy, that was their passion, that's, that's what they you know, felt happy with. And to eat, they would go to the garbage cans, the dumpsters, and take out the bones from the fast food chicken that we finished eating. They would take it out, bring it home, chop it up again, re-spice it, fry it, and then add water to boil it into a soup. And that was their food, our leftovers that they took out of the garbage from a fast food restaurant. So there's people that don't have what we have. And to, I think sometimes we just need to literally go down to the slums of whatever city we're living in or go to the, you know, whatever area has poor people, usually a downtown or a central, you know, area of the city where there's homeless people living and give them from the best of what we have. So go to your closet, take out your Armani suit, your, you know, Giorgio Armani's and your perfume bottles and, you know, for sisters, get out some of your jewelry or whatever, or something that's useful for those people. So socks and clothing and nice, you know, down duvets and comforters that we sleep with and go and give it to them and feel what it feels like to give someone else what you enjoy and see the smile on their face. Your heart softens immediately. Great advice. How about for the person now? The brother's like, I left, you know, my, my, my heart with that honey at the club. And she's like, you know what, I'm just thinking about committing suicide if I can't get this man. And she's living in fantasy land. And you have an opportunity now that they're listening. How can you get someone like this, from your experience, to reclaim their heart? So, uh, the... Uh, what advice do you like well, to give? Yeah, so... Somebody who's literally heartbroken. <laughs> uh, there's, you could say to them, look, it's not the end of the world. There's lots of people there, right? Uh, there's enough fish in the sea for all of us, uh, part of the analogy. And uh, the second thing is that we remind ourselves that uh, Allah says in the Quran, 
that whatever you have is going to end. And whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has is always going to last. It's always going to be there. So we aim for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has. That's Jannah. We aim to get there. If we want everlasting love, we aim to get to Jannah. Because that's where we'll get that love. If we want everlasting pleasure, we aim for that in Jannah. And then we will have it. So just that perspective that it gets. Of course, if we all want uh, pleasure and enjoyment in this dunya as well. But the perspective has to be there that whatever we have in this dunya is going to end. It's going to wither away. The shine will wear off. But whatever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in Jannah, never will, it, uh, never will the shine wear off. In fact, it will get even better and better. Just as an example, the people who go to Jannah, the Prophet told us that a, a man will leave his house in Jannah, come back home, and he will say to his wife, you're more beautiful than when I left you. And she will say, no, you're more handsome when you left. Right? So your beauty increases day by day, and your love increases uh, moment by moment in Jannah. SubhanAllah, how beautiful is that? So we aim for that, and we keep that in our minds. For, we're almost out of time, and before we close it up, now for the not yet Muslims, because everyone has the potential to submit to God alone, to worship the Creator, not the creation, and they're tuning in. We're talking about God, we're talking about the heart, and people are realizing that, okay, you know what, I can't get happiness in all of these material, superficial things, but now they're like, okay, I'll just go join this religion, that religion, all these religions out there. How do I know what you guys are talking about is the way of life that's definitely from the Creator with all these other different religions claiming that they're the way and the only way, the right way. How can I differentiate which one is truly the way from God? Uh, ultimately, truth is always set apart from falsehood. And, uh, you know, as a person who was born into Islam, I, I, I see, uh, you know, I always ask myself, uh, would I come to Islam? Would I have walked over to Islam? Had I not known it, uh, by the blessing of having been given it from birth. And, you know, subhanAllah, those who come into faith, uh, you know, Allah describes them in the Qur'an that Allah's opened their chest to the truth. And, you know, the verses in the Qur'an, which is always the first step to faith. Uh, for me, um, I always recommend to people to read the Qur'an. Read it on your own. Don't, don't, don't seek higher interpretation. Just read, and I, I do recommend, you know, the Oxford University... Uh, press edition, Dr. Uh, Halim's translation of the Quran. It's very accessible to an English market, to an English uh, uh, reader. It's very clear, it's very polished, and there's no added commentary. There's no uh, added values that are added to it. So just read what the man interpreted God's word as being. And, you know, I, I, I just want to share with you like a, an experience of one of, uh, you know, a peop, uh, one of my friends from high school. And he was uh, over, over at my house when we were young. And, you know, I'd never, you know, shared the Qur'an with him or said, read this or, you know, nothing like that. And I walked out of the room, came back, and he was crying. And he was standing near my desk, and he said, I said, what's wrong with you? I thought something, you know, something happened. I go, what, what's wrong with you? And he goes, uh, you know, and he pointed to the Qur'an, and he just tapped it like this. He said, this is the truth. And he goes, I want to be a Muslim. I said, Allahu Akbar, you know, why? He goes, well, you know, I always wanted to read it, but I felt like I didn't want to ask you. So when you went out, I just turned it over, and I read the first sentence. The first sentence I read, it's the truth. So I said, well, what's this sentence? And I look in it, and it was from Surah An-Nisa, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَأْكُلُونَ أَمْوَالَ الْيَتَامَ ظُلْمًا إِنَّمَا يَأْكُلُونَ فِي بُطُونِهِمْ نَارًا those who consume the wealth of the orphans unjustly, they are ingesting in themselves hellfire. Now, what I didn't know about my friend was that uh, he was an orphan child, and he was from one foster home to the next, and he was put in neglectful homes where the money that the state and the government paid towards their to him was usurped by others. It was gone in the form of liquor and in the form of other things, and no one cared for him. And he as a young child grew up seeing that those who were paid to look after him failed him. And the first verse that he opened and looked at in the Qur'an moved his heart that he said, this is the truth, the one who did this to me. God is not unjust. 
My life is not something that was wasted. The tragedies I experienced, there will be recompense. And you know, the brother now, alhamdulillah, he's in Toronto, married with four children. You know, Muslim, mashallah. And you know, the, uh, so I say to, you know, uh, our, our brothers in humanity, our sisters in humanity, read the Quran, you have nothing to lose. Uh, begin from anywhere you like. If you're a Christian, you want to read about what we say about Jesus, open the 19th chapter. Read about Mary, uh, you know, the mother of Jesus. Read his story, his immaculate birth, you know, what we believe. If you want to know, you know, what are the things that we value, look at, look at how God describes, you know, heaven and hell in the final chapters of the Quran. Just read, read, read. And that's the first word of the Quran, Iqra. The aim of it, just read. You have nothing to lose. Give us some closing comments, suggestions on the heart, or anything else we in a tweet in a what tweet. you what you can fit in a tweet where we got two minutes so we want to get both of you in so in a tweet give them some advice some encouragement take it away you know what eddie it's tough to do these tweets you keep giving me tweets give him the tweet let him start with the tweet <laughs> okay, i'll start with the tweet uh i have a friend from uh university it's gonna be a little longer two tweets okay uh who inspired me to take Islam seriously. I was just a cultural Muslim born in a Muslim family. He was a convert. And I saw him and I was so inspired by his uh, practice, of, practice of Islam. We used to, pr in, during exam time, skip prayer. Right? During the exam, if Dhuhr Salah came and went, we would be like, whatever. He said, how could you do that? Right? He said, I would start, he, would, he would leave the exam, go outside and pray, and come back and then finish his exam. SubhanAllah. And that just, that action was so moving that all of us who were young and saw him were inspired. So I asked him, how did you convert to Islam? He said, I read Surah Yusuf, the translation, and I said, this has to be from God. It can't be from a human being. Well, she give me a Facebook tweet, uh, post. All right, I'll give you a tweet. Uh, you know you need God, and, or sorry, you know you could recognize God when you're flying at 36,000 feet watching your favorite movie and turbulence hits and you could feel your heart in your throat. That's where you recognize the entire plane just starts yelling, oh my God. And that's where you realize you need God. So everyone needs God and everyone recognizes that they need God. They just don't know it until some sort of turbulence hits in their life. And that's that moment. As they say, there, there are no atheists in the foxholes. Have you heard the saying? Alhamdulillah, at the Sound Heart Conference with our beloved Sheikh. Thank you so much. We started with peace. We end with peace. Assalamu alaikum. Peace be with you. Assalamu alaikum. And for the not yet Muslims tuning in, when you're seeking the truth and you want to know the truth, God Almighty, Allah, the Creator, will facilitate a way. And for those who have accepted Islam, we need to make it a full-time gig, not a part-time gig, and then we will reap all the benefits and have a sound heart so at the end of not only the day, but life, we can get to Jannah and avoid the hellfire. Tune in every week to The Dean Show. Subscribe if you haven't already. Facebook, Twitter, follow us. Keep up with us. Make dua for us. We'll see you next time. Peace be with you. Takbir! Everybody, thank you for coming out and being with us. Make sure also support the program. Tune into the deanshow.com. Through there, you can find our YouTube channel. We'll have this show up soon, inshallah. For those that don't catch us on the satellite TVs, like us on the Facebook, the Twitter, and share our shows so more people can benefit. And you can get the reward, inshallah. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. Peace.